Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff. Welcome back to Biochemistry on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be discussing how dairy products like milk and cheese can produce inflammation in the human body. Now, it's well known that dairy products do produce inflammation in the human body. I've often talked about in other videos how sugar is highly inflammatory. I would argue that sugar is still probably a lot worse than dairy products overall in terms of inflammation and promoting atherosclerosis and so forth. But if your body is lit up like a Christmas tree with inflammation, uh, definitely giving up dairy products is certainly a route you could try. Now, before we get into actually how this works, we need to understand a little bit about the history of cows. Now, in this first slide here, we're talking about Western cows versus Old World dairy cows. On the left here, we have an Old World cow, specifically an Indian cow. On the right side here, we have what most people in the Western Hemisphere, and maybe even some parts of the East, are used to seeing, and this is the Jersey cow. I wouldn't go as far as to say that the Jersey is not a cow, but it is a mutant cow, and we'll talk about why it's a mutant in a couple of minutes. Now, if you take a quick look at these two cows, you should be able to spot obvious differences between them. On the left here, the old world cow has a hump on its back, has a flap of skin beneath the neck. These two things are absent in the Jersey cow. What's more important is actually what we cannot see, and that's the milk, more specifically the proteins contained in the milk. Now, of course, there's a lot of proteins contained in cow's milk. One of the important ones is casein. And I'll preface this now by saying that the old world cows tend to produce casein proteins of the A2 beta casein type. And I've colored this green so you know it's the good kind. Whereas the mutant cows tend to produce two types, a mixture of A2 beta casein, but also this A1 beta casein, which is not so good. And we'll talk about why that is in the coming slides. Okay, so the old world cow produces A2 beta casein, which is good. The mutant cow produces A1 beta casein, which is bad. And let's actually understand why the A1 beta casein is bad. And to do that, we need to take a look back thousands of years and observe a mutation that actually occurred in the development of cows. So long story short, at some point in the timeline in the development of the Jersey cow, there was a missense mutation in the gene that encodes beta casein. Okay. So if we were to look at the gene encoding alpha-2 beta casein, at the 67 position, that sequence of nucleotides encodes the amino acid proline, and that's what we want to exist there. Okay. However, at some point in this timeline, probably a couple thousand years ago, there was a mutation in that gene that caused the gene to encode a histidine at the 67 position instead of a proline. And this is, of course, a missense mutation because the identity of the amino acid changed at that position. If the Identity of the amino acid remained the same, so it remained a proline, it'd be a silent mutation. But this one is a missense mutation. Whenever you change the amino acid, especially if that amino acid has different properties, you're going to change the properties of that protein, potentially making that protein non-functional. Or in this case, we're going to see changes in how it's broken down. So let's suppose a person consumes some of this milk from a Western cow, and it contains a mixture of A1 and A2 beta casein. So that milk and the proteins are going to go through the digestive tract, get broken down to some extent, and eventually end up in the small intestine where the majority of the, of the breakdown and the absorption should occur. Now let's first take a look at A2 beta casein here. This is the good kind. Remember, it's in green. So if we look here, it has this partial amino acid sequence, valine, tyrosine, proline, phenylalanine, proline, glycine, proline, isoleucine, proline. In this nine amino acid sequence, four of them are proline. That's a pretty high percentage of proline in this region. And it turns out that proline actually has some properties when you find it in a sequence. Proline actually puts a kink or a bend into the amino acid sequence anywhere you find it. So in this sequence of nine amino acids, and probably a couple on this side as well, you're going to have a huge amount of bending and kinks in the protein sequence and structure, which is going to make digestion by enzymes extremely difficult. And this 67 position proline here especially makes digestion by enzymes extremely difficult, in fact, almost impossible. So this sequence right here within A2 beta casein remains undigested. And that may seem like a bad thing, 
but as we're going to see in a minute, that's actually a good thing. So this entire sequence right here will not be digested. It will not be broken down. Now, remember, in A1 beta casein, we have a missense mutation at the 67 position, so we're no longer going to have this proline. We're going to have this histidine instead. Okay. Now, in A2 beta casein, this bond, this peptide bond between the isoleucine at position 66 and proline 67, this bond cannot be hydrolyzed because the proline right here, because that kink it puts into the chain, hinders the cleavage. Now we don't have this proline here in A1 beta casein. Now we have a histidine here. Histidine is just a basic amino acid. Okay, so it doesn't have this kink that it puts into the chain. Therefore, this histidine cannot block the cleavage between it and the isoleucine at position 66. And so this bond right here can readily be split. And also this valine tyrosine peptide bond can also be split. And so if you split the bond right there between valine and tyrosine and between isoleucine and histidine, you get this seven amino acid peptide that comes off. And this is called beta casomorphin seven. So what do we see here? A2 beta casein does not lead to beta casomorphin seven production, whereas A1 beta casein does lead to beta casomorphin seven production. Now why is that important? Because people who consume milk from western cows that contains both of these isoforms of beta casein have worsened post-digestive symptoms. And also these people have an increased expression of inflammatory biomarkers after the consumption, and those would include things like C-reactive protein, sorry for the misspelling, and also several complement proteins, including C1Q. Both of these are known to be involved in inflammation, especially C-reactive protein. What's interesting, though, is that for people that consumed cow's milk that only contained a 2 beta casein, which would be from an old world cow, like an Indian cow, they did not show these same effects. They did not show worsened post-digestive symptoms, and they did not show an increase in inflammatory biomarkers. And this suggests that something about the A1 beta casein is actually causing these inflammatory properties in vivo. And it turns out that what's causing it specifically is not the protein as a whole, it's actually this beta casomorphine 7 that comes off of it. So here's a quick summary of what we just talked about. Here's that A2 beta casein. It's going through the digestive tract, and it can be broken down into amino acids and small peptides. Okay, And then this A1 beta casein is also broken down to amino acids, but the difference here is that you get this beta casomorphin 7 production, which here I have represented by the red circle. And you can see here that beta casomorphin 7 can actually be picked up by antibodies and bound. So it turns out that in a lot of individuals, um, they actually manufacture antibodies against beta casomorphin 7. Remember, antibodies can bind small peptides. And so whenever these small peptides, like beta casomorphin 7, are bound by the antibodies, the antibodies become activated and they can induce an immune reaction. Okay? And so what we know is a mixture of A2 beta casein and A1 beta casein, like we see in Western cows, produces inflammation. If we look at cow's milk containing only A2 beta casein, like old world cows, there's no inflammatory reaction. And so this suggests that it's A1 beta casein that's actually producing it through the production of beta casomorphin 7. So remember, an immunogen is something that can induce an immune response. In this case, that's beta casomorphin 7, and we're getting those ultimately through the diet. So this AG right here is just antigen or immunogen. And so you can see here again, these antibodies are picking up those immunogens, are picking up beta casomorphin 7. When those antibodies become activated, you get the activation of the complement system. This is the antibody-dependent complement system. And so here's C1Q. I won't go into all of this, but again, you get this entire activation of the complement cascade. And when proteins C3 and C5 become activated, remember they're essentially just split in half into an A and a B half. And the B halves, like C3B, C5B, these allow the formation of a membrane attack complex. So if there's an invading pathogen like bacteria, it just punctures a hole in that membrane of the bacterium and it is destroyed. But the other half, C3A and C5A, the A essentially stands for anaphylatoxins. Anaphylatoxins are proteins that 
induce inflammation. And the way that they function mainly is they come over to these cells called mast cells and they bind to receptors on the mast cell plasma membrane. That activates the mast cell and triggers it to degranulate, which causes the release of this chemical right here, which is histamine. And histamine is going to be a major mediator in inflammation and chemotaxis, getting immune cells to the area, which also produces more inflammation in that area. And so as you can see here, immunogens from the diet, like beta casomorphin 7, are going to be able to produce inflammation really through this antibody-dependent complement system. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding and overview of why dairy tends to be inflammatory in the human body. It has nothing to do with lactose. Um, lactose intolerance is something entirely different, and that's the topic of another video that I have on my channel. Uh, this is the proteins found within milk, mainly the casein protein. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.